Steve, Pastor Steve, um, prophet winners. I've got something that the Lord laid on my heart this morning. He's going to do a couple of things. I'm going to put him to work this morning. Uh, he's going to come and receive this morning's tithes and offering. But I got to say this first. I wasn't going to do that. I thought we were going to do this out in the hallway. You know how we do. But this needs to be said in front of everybody. And for those of you watching online. As long as I've been born again in all the places that I've been, I have been fortunate. My wife and I have been fortunate to be around some great men and women of God. Okay? Truly. Um, and with that being said, on September the 7th of 2018, my wife and I took a trip to Madison, Wisconsin to meet some people, um, well, meet for a board meeting for a ministry. The, the ministry name is Three Degrees Ministry. And we met, we talked, and I met this young man. He, he looks like a, he looks like Opie's brother or something, you know what I'm saying? But, <laughs> but, but anyway, I gotta, I gotta pick at him just a little bit. But while, while we were there, um, it was just, it was, I thought it was just gonna be another board meeting, dull, kind of dry, kind of, okay, let's hurry up and get out of here type thing, gotta go back home. And the Spirit of the Lord showed up. The best time in your life, no matter what you're doing, whether you're sitting at your desk, at your terminal, whether or not you're cutting the grass, shoveling snow, washing your car, the best time in your life is wherever you are when the Spirit of the Lord shows up. And so we can't live on past experiences. And a lot of us do it or try to. Anyway, so at that board meeting, he began to speak and share some things that I've got it, I've got it uh, written down for my own personal, my wife and I's personal reference, and I've listened to it many times. But the Lord said, Steve, the Lord said this uh, to me. You, you, you spoke yesterday at one of the sessions about your encounter, and I'd heard that part before, where those three men of God, you walked up and shook one hand, another hand, and another hand. And you were, weren't you at Eagle Mountain? Okay. Anybody ever been to Eagle Mountain International Church in Newark, Texas? Where does it sit? <laughs> On a hill. They call it mountain. Mountains are usually high. I get that. All right. And so as I, was, as I was listening to the Lord this morning, 1 Samuel 10, verses 5 through 7, is what he gave me to share with you. And I'm reading this from the Expanded Bible. And this is the word of the Lord from Samuel to Saul, the first king of Israel. He says, then you will go to Gibeah, or the hill of God, where a Philistine camp or garrison is. When you approach this town, a group of prophets will come down from the place of worship or the high place. That's Eagle Mountain. He said they will be playing harps, tambourines, flutes, lyres, and they will be prophesying. I know that's what took place when you were there. All the worship, all the praise, the significant ushering in of the presence of God. He says, verse 6 says, Then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon or come on and seize and possess you with power. You will prophesy with them. And that happened. And it was prophesied over you. And he says, and you will be changed into a different man. Verse 7 says, after these signs happen, do whatever you find to do, or what must be done, or what you see fit to do what your hands find to do. He says, because God will help or is with you. So I tell you that you have been changed into another man, the evidence of which took place on this past week. So I say to you, by the authority of God, as a shepherd of this house, that you are no longer just pastor, Steve, but you are a prophet of the Most High God. Now I'm going to tell you all something. If you haven't heard this man speak, you need to remove all distractions. This, 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 we are honored to, I'm telling you, the power and the anointing of the Most High God is on this man. How many, can, how many that were here in this past week can testify to that? I'm telling you what I know. The reason why I say this, and I say this fully and directly into the camera, that every prophet of God has to have a starting place. And I am, I am in full covenant. This church is in full covenant. If you ever call me and say, Tommy, I've got a word for life point. The pulpit is yours. Yeah. 
We will rearrange us just as if it were dad, Dr. Savell himself, because the strength of the Lord is upon you. He's going to receive this morning tithes and offerings. After that, he's going to bring to today's message. I hope you just come on, situate yourself. If you have to go to the restroom, refresh. Don't let your body cause you to miss a word from God this morning. Amen. Turn your phones off. Don't be distracted by text messages. Your email is not that important because the word of the Lord is coming to us this morning. Would you stand to your feet and welcome none other than the prophet of God, Steve Winters from ECG Ministries, all the way from Iron Mountain, Michigan. Got it? All right. There we go. Good morning. You always know when God is in the house, as I always say, Lord, your promise is that signs and wonders will confirm your word. Two signs and wonders, unbeknownst to you, have already occurred in this house, let alone whatever's going on in your own worship of the Lord. One of which was, I'm back in the back during prayer time, and I'm standing back where that young lady is right there, and uh, Caleb helped this dear man right here come through the door. The Lord said to me, before you are through here today, you will lay hands on that man with the elders and see him rise up. And as a sign and a wonder and a confirmation to you, I tell you now his name is Jim. Yes! Today's your day, Jim. The joy of the Lord is your strength, and it is on this man, and it is thick. Hallelujah. Amen. So pastor may have broke protocol by having me do the offering message rather than Miss Pastor Lynette here, but I'm going to break protocol again, and I'm just a guest, but I've been given his permission. Always respect the elder. I don't know when we're getting to the tithe. The second sign in wonder this morning is when he said we're doing announcements now rather than after the tithe, because I've got pretty clear instruction of the Lord that I'm not calling for the tithe until faith breaks loose in this place. Amen. 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 So, there was actually a third confirmation that came from over here from Pastor. As she looked me in the eyes, we prayed together this morning, and she said that you are here to love them. And that was confirmation because I actually wrote down on my notes here this morning before, in love, take your time, this is important, of the Lord. Love disciplines. So though I'm a guest, Hebrews chapter 12, please. <clears throat> This is not in my notes. This started as a word from the Lord for life point, and I'm going to come back to that. It became much more. But we're going to look at a lot of words today because it's the word of God that elevates faith. And we're going to take a long time talking about Jesus. Amen. We're going to break some things loose off of ourselves. Amen. We're going to see a tithe come in that will open the windows of heaven and rebuke the devourer for your sake. Amen. Therefore, since we are encompassed by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let us look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, the joy that was set before him. 
Can you imagine standing there looking at your own cross and knowing joy? Amen. That's a symptom of freedom. Amen. Earlier we were asked, are any of you free? Yes. There's a symptom of freedom right there. Amen. Despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and your hearts give up. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed while striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as sons. My son, do not despise the discipline from the Lord, nor grow weary when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines and scourges every son whom he receives. Endure discipline. God is dealing with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not discipline? If you are without discipline, of which everyone has partaken, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Down to 11. Now, no discipline seems to be joyful at the time, but grievous. Yet afterward, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness in those who have been trained by it. Discipline allows two choices. Receive your training or sink deeper. Therefore, lift up your tired hands, strengthen your weak knees, Make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame go out of joint, but rather be healed. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. It comes first, before the things, before the needs are met. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I would dare say, that if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, you'd be to church on time. I would dare say that if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, there should be more than five people here for pre-service prayer. I would dare say if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, you might attend a conference that pastor worked very hard to arrange. And I would dare say your leadership in this church has proven a loyalty and a faithfulness to the cause of this church that is way above average. And they deserve some honor. Amen? I am not here to exalt the persons of Pastor Tommy and Pastor Lynette. But what I am here to honor, to hold in high esteem, and to viciously protect is the office they hold. Pastor, fivefold, you have an invitation if you're called to come and partake of that anointing if you feel the Lord drawing you in that place. But you need to be faithful in the little things first. These two deserve punctuality. They deserve your skills. They deserve your time. They deserve your love. I encourage you to start taking advantage of all this church has going on here to take advantage of the Spirit of God that is ushered in at prayer time and to get here on time. Yes. Amen. Do not allow yourself to be seen as a sluggard. Amen? Amen? Yes. So who is this dark stranger that rides into town and dares open like that to you? I am the man of God, called from the deep, dark woods to the town of Coralville, Iowa, by the Lord God, by the man of God, and by the Spirit of God, with a calling to come in here and to love you all on the higher ground. That is my instruction. I have oodles of notes. And I can go along. That was proven these last couple of days. Oh, can I go along? I ignore all sources of time. And I'm going to go until the Lord says stop. And you know what time the Lord's going to say stop? When the Lord has broken the chains off your heart to the point that you may experience an anointing of God in here that breaks the yoke, that you may be set free to recognize yourself as a child of the living God, and that you may see that your tithe does not no longer fall by the wayside. In Jesus' name. Now, 
What a way to start announcements. Where is back there? You guys are so blessed to have a tech expert on your team here. Because this man back here has just narrowed your excuses for not giving down to almost zero. Any snowbirds watching on camera, any members that did not come in that's happening to watching, or anybody that happens to watch this film down the road as it posts, tithe. Tithe. That's what I got called up here first to talk about, is the tithe. It says a little fox has spoiled the vine. We need to get out from away from those little foxes. We need to step away from those things that would make us stumble and fall, that would affect our joy and our ability to be able to enjoy the benefits of the tithe. Now, it was just yesterday that Pastor Tommy asked me to step up here and to preach the tithe. So I'm going to step into my notes. We'll see where the Lord takes this. But I need you as the same instruction. Those that attended the conference, this is going to be a real familiar instruction. I hope you rehearsed well. But I need you all to be expecting. I need you all to be sitting here in these seats, praying in the Spirit, to be expecting the Lord to be speaking to you, expecting the Lord to move in your life, and expecting the Lord to show you how desperately He desires to bestow good into your life. Yeah. So true. So true. It's going to begin with obedience. One of the little foxes is being on time. The Lord may give you a library of little foxes. Part of obedience is being transparent and open before the Lord and allowing Him to bring that correction to you. The discipline of the Lord, but we read that there is a rich harvest of fruit of righteousness that follows obedience. Obedience will only come as you are transparent and open before the living God. And on Friday, the capacity in this church for that to happen manifested on Friday? Raise your hand if you're at the conference and I will be witness to you and accountable to you as to what you saw in that room on Friday. Raise your hand. How many do I have in here? At least half the class. Amen. Friday afternoon, God showed up. An anointing hit that room, and from the vantage point being up front, half that room, I promise you, God is my witness, was in tears. Grown men in tears. Not that we said much. It was just the Spirit of God that ushered in. And where the Spirit of God is... Amen. It was powerful. Mm. All right. The tithe. I'm going to teach. I'm going to preach. And let the Lord do the increase here. The tithe is simply 10%. And it is 10% of income. What we're going to find out before I'm done here, and this may be the longest tithing message you have ever received in this sanctuary... The tithe is money. The tithe is your income, whether fixed, variable, salaried, or hourly, part-time, full-time, abundance, or what may not feel so much so. The tithe is 10%. It's given to the church, and it comes to where you're fed. And the tithe is not only for the individuals as to what comes into LifePoint, but the tithe from LifePoint, as you asked yesterday, and I didn't really answer your question appropriately, goes from life point to where you guys are being fed. Because you also have spiritual fathers, mothers, that guide you and counsel you. They're worthy of the tithe. Amen? Amen. The tithe is a spiritual event. I had dinner with them yesterday, and we were talking about the tithe. And if the tithe were only an envelope, a stamp, and a check, or only an app, why is the kingdom of God not full of millionaires? If that was all there was to the tithe, why are we not the billionaires of America? What component ingredient is missing? Number one, I think understanding. So if you simply open your heart, receive some instruction. 
Levi's 27, verse 30. One-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees or money from your wallet or through a credit card or through an app, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. The tithe is set apart. It is sanctified. It is a holy event. It is a spiritual event. If you do not see it that way, you are only paying a bill. If the tithe does not bring you enjoyment, joy to the fullest, excitement, and you cannot give the tithe, 2 Corinthians 9, without a glad heart, you're missing it. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. We don't tithe for God's benefit. It's an act of love and gratitude for how good God has been to you, and it should be done first. If you do not receive income and deal with the tithe first, I see cash flow having a problem here. That money is going to end up in your cash flow. It is going to be spent, and you've missed the opportunity of the tithe. Don't take the management of the tithe lightly. It is done before God. It is done in the Spirit, and it is out of obedience by the command of God. When God asks us to do something, it's not for his benefit. When God asks us to do something, it's to get something back to you. And some of you, I'm by witness of the Lord. Some of you are hearing this, and you're saying, I've heard this all before. It doesn't matter. I perceive your thoughts. There are people in this room right now, under the voice of God, that are thinking, I've heard this before. It doesn't matter. Repent. Because of you, the curse is in your life. We're going to get to that. Because of you. It's never God's fault. It's a promise of God and his love cannot fail. So whose fault is it? God has entrusted us with something that is very precious to him. And the depth of God's blessing on your life is determined by how well you manage this blessing, this privilege of the tithe. The tithe, it's given to God. Why? Obedience. Its purpose, to open the windows of heaven and for the Lord to rebuke the devourer for your sake. When the tithe is given, a powerful spiritual event takes place. Powerful spiritual event. When pastor comes up here to actually receive the tithe, allow the Lord to spark your imagination and see that by the giving of that tithe, actually open your eyes to see the spiritual magnitude of the event, to see the windows of heaven open on your behalf and the Lord holding back the devourer. Why does the Lord take the responsibility of holding back the devourer? Because we usually don't see what's coming until it's too late. Unless you're in your prayer closet and allowing the Lord to actually show you, watch out for this, watch out for that, we don't know what the Satan has planned against us for the day. But if we know because of the tithe that the Lord rebukes the devourer for our sake, you have nothing to be concerned about and you can go through your day under Psalm 91 protection because the Lord's got your back. It's our choice. First fruits. Given off of the increase. There's four types of giving. I'm going to cover these four and then we'll move forward. There's the tithe and then there's first fruits. First fruits, first fruits are given off increase. You experience first fruits in your life, which is increase, or what I might call the suddenlies, in all of a sudden, wow, open an envelope, or wow, so you get handed, here's a raise. It's a one-time event in which you come back to the Lord and you say, thank you. I am not married to money and it has no control or power over me. Money is a tool that I use to survive in a capitalistic society. That is all that money exists in my life for. It has no control over me. I take control over it and it will not be a source of evil in my life. I bring my increase before you, Father, and I do it with joy to show you money has no power over me, and I thank you for the increase, and Lord, I expect more. 
That's the first fruit. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. Honor the Lord with your substance, your increase, and the first fruits, substance, and first fruits of your increase. Alms. Charitable giving. Matthew 6. Do not do your alms in front of man to be seen and be noticed, but do it in secret, and your Father in heaven will reward you. Alms. Charitable giving. It's the only one done for man, and it's the only one you can't talk about. Matthew 6, firm instruction. Tell somebody about your alms. Go and boast to somebody of what you've done. There's no reward. The Lord rewards what's done in secret. Why in secret? It protects the individual that you have donated time or money to. Dignity of mankind, which is so precious today, when lives have shrunk to the most click, when your ability to walk free of somebody posting something for you, protect the dignity of each other, protect the privilege of the alm. In your reimbursement, Proverbs 19.17, he that has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. The Lord says we pay our debts. If you've lent something to the Lord, the very next phrase in that verse is, he will pay you back. Amen. So alms are revolving door. They go out, they come in. They go out, they come in. And you don't tell anybody but you and the Lord. The seed. I like Jesse Duplantis. The seed starts at 11%. That is a phrase that just has stuck with me. The seed begins at 11%. That is where it is over and above the tithe, but that is where the 30, 60, and 100 fold begin. The seed determines your future. The seed creates your future. The seed is your fastest way out of debt. The seed is your fastest way to prosperity. It's the surest way to stop poverty in your life and the fastest way to debt cancellation. And it must be given to fertile soil. You will know them by their fruit. Do not give your seed to a ministry that stinks, full of worms. They have to be bearing fruit. If you mix up any of these, I've got my 10% set aside. It's $100. But, wow, look at this guy in the street corner. I'm sorry for him. It's cold. Take $10. You just made $10, 10% of your tithe and all. Now you're out of place twice. You've misallocated the tithe, and you've robbed from God. So you just missed two blessings. You missed the reimbursement for the all. And you missed the windows of heaven and rebuking of the devourer because you didn't bring your whole offering into the storehouse. I mean, does that need to be explained any differently? Four different types of giving. All right. St. Corinthians 9, 16 to 15. We already read that God loves a cheerful giver, but God is able to make all grace abound to you so that always having all sufficiency in everything, you may have in abundance for every good deed. So I ask you, when there's an opportunity or a nudge on your heart to give or do something for somebody, do you check your checkbook balance first? Do you need to make sure there's enough money in the checking account before you're able to do your tithe? Malachi 3, I'll start to build this back up now. I'll be done here tearing it apart. And I'll... Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. God forbid we stay there. 
For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing for you that there will be not enough room to receive it. And I will, will and shall, will and shall, will and shall, will and shall. As you're going through the Bible, 7,000 times there's a will and a shall. Every one of those 7,000 is a promise of God. Every single one of them is a promise of God. What are we missing in the church today and what are we going to be getting to when I finally do get to my message at 3 or 4 this afternoon? Amen. <sighs> the church needs to reinvite the promises of God back into the realm of faith to see manifestation. Amen. We have a weak church. We have a weak church. There's been a lot promised with very little return. That is not God's fault. It's the church's fault. Because of you. All nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land. Can you see yourself that way? Delightful to the nations? God is not condemning. At this point, it's the Jews. But God is not condemning us in the reading of this passage. He is trying to get something to us. He is trying to bring the discipline of the Lord that brings righteousness in love to show you that he is a good, good father, that he is a good God, and that he is faithful to his promises so that he may bestow his goodness into your life, that you may truly become the light on the hill that no one can conceal, that you may get out into the community and people will say, what is this? And now I come back to the word of the Lord, which is back on Hebrews chapter 12, where I'm sitting here in praise and worship, and Kelsey is just ripping it up up here and just singing his heart out. And the Lord said, there is a great cloud of witnesses that is watching Life Point. There is a great cloud of witnesses out here. They just haven't seen what they're witnessing yet because they need to manifest. The Lord is ready to manifest. The Lord is ready to reveal his children to the community. What will draw them in is the signs and the wonders. One of those signs and wonders is your advancement. You coming into your passion. You coming into the purity of the Lord. You coming into the perfect place in the kingdom of God, accepting what he has called you to do, receiving the anointing of the Holy Ghost to do it to the fullest of his calling, and to free people. To free people. To give them freedom from the bondage that they walk in to give away freely what you have already received. And it all starts with the tithe. It all starts with the tithe. God intervenes on our behalf before the devil succeeds because we tithe. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If we do, if we do our part, God will do his. God wants our finances in order, and it should begin with the proper handling of the tithe. And we should be not only living it, but we should be daily expecting the enjoyment of the benefit of the tithe. It should be a living entity in our life, in our heart, sorry, in our being. In a minute, we're going to be talking about position. We're going to be talking about passion. And we're going to be talking about prosperity. But if you don't get your position, if you don't understand this position of a spiritual event happening, you've missed it. You've missed it. So God rebukes the devourer. I want you to think of your tithe as erecting a fence. And Iowa is a pretty open space. Michigan's a pretty open space up north. But have you ever traveled to Texas? Boy, do they know what a fence is in Texas. The fence says keep out. You're not allowed. You're trespassing. What's behind that fence belongs to me, not to you. I have the ability, the privilege of giving you permission to come in by choice. But as of right now, you're trespassing. Your tithe builds a fence. 
in which you have control to post a no trespassing sign to the devil, to keep him off what belongs to you, to keep his hands off anything that's pertaining to you, of anything you've put your hand to, you have the choice. The question is, what choice are you making? What are you choosing? The tithe is a fence. God patrols that fence. God walks the perimeter. God has angels posted up on the corners. I love you, brother. Bishop, good to have you. Amen. The tithe is a fence. And it comes with some questions. What do you have going on behind that fence that the windows of heaven can prosper? What do you have going on behind that fence that the devourer can't touch? Or if the devourer happens to be going to and fro across the earth, seeing whom he can taunt and whatever, does he go by because there's nothing going on? Does he just pass on through saying there are nothing? Come on, guys. Deuteronomy 28, what you put your hand to will prosper. What are you putting your hand to? I promise you, when your favorite tele... Oh, I don't watch TV, but I think today's Super Bowl Sunday. For you football fans in this room, no condemnation, but I promise you, you're going to make it on time to that game. Whew. No condemnation. Find your place in the kingdom. It starts with knowing that you're a son and daughter of God. We just sang that song on the leadoff out here, but were they just words, or is that truly ministering truth to your heart that you are truly a son and daughter of the king of the universe who patrols your fence, who watches over your stuff, and has got so much more increase for you if you would simply find your place, apply your hand, you take the first step into that Jordan, and the very next thing that happens is a whole new world of opportunity opens up to you. And it's dry land. There's nothing in your way. There's nothing that's even going to make your toes wet. You're going to walk. And the reason you walk and you don't run over the Jordan is because at the same time you're enjoying the increase, there's no labor and toil. There's no sweat. Right. There is nothing that can hinder the path. That's right. That's right. In the Old Testament, God entered the law as law to make sure they did it. Today we have grace. Today we have this thing called grace for obedience. We have a choice. We don't break the law by not bringing the tithe. We break justice, but we do not break the law. When you break justice, it is no different as throwing open the gates of your fence and saying, come on in. Justice keeps enemy out. Injustice invites them back in. It is your choice. Life or death, blessing or cursing, it is your choice at how secure your fence is. And it starts with obedience. Because he is worthy. Because he is worthy. We are about to worship him with our tithe. We are about to come before him with gratitude and joy. And we are about to lay at his feet the seed money. What he's purposed in your heart. 10% plus. 10% plus. The offering, the seed, the advancement, the prosperity starts at 11. The 10% plus. Now let's get real with that money. Let's get real. Number one. Actually, no. Number one. I'm going the wrong direction. My dear brother and sister. The tithe. Their livelihood. Their peace. The prevention of burnout. Or the prevention of debt. Their livelihood, security, and safety comes from God, and God relies on man, the members, to ensure that the blessing he has intended for these two start with you. 
You take care of these two. This is no accident that you're here meeting in a hotel with these two ordained to sit over you. That's part of the calling on their life. And a man of God is worthy of his wage. That's number one. Number two, this is awesome display. This is, this is great stuff. Is this only pastor's vision? Are you united in this vision? 100% behind his back? Prove it. Prove it. If the Lord has purposed in your heart that this is a reality for life point, then don't you dare be afraid of the fact that he's not going to provide for whatever is needed to get this started. Pastor, receive your tithe. Sit down. More to come. Now I'm going to tell you what I didn't tell you in the beginning when I introduced you. The three prophets of God that he walked up to. He didn't walk up to them. He was just going through the line. He could tell Baranaki. And as he was walking through the line, shaking their hands, each one of them said something to him. Whatever it was, not, doesn't matter. And the one, the one, you may not even know him, because, uh, which, is, which is baffling to me, but pulled him out and called him what he is today, a pastor. Have you ever heard Dr. Dr. Barkley's testimony about his, his, you heard that? That's one of the most powerful things. I tell it all the time in our new partners class. I won't tell it all because it's long. Dr. Barkley, Mark Barkley, Midland, Michigan, one of the greatest prophets, pastors of God, a preacher of the gospel, integrity at such a high level. His granddaughter was drowning in a pool or had drowned in a pool. I'm cut through it. And his son, his son, they found her, her hair or something like that had gotten entangled in the drain. And by the time they found her, she was already lifeless. His son stood up and said at the top of his lungs, the devourer is rebuked for my sake. When they took her to the hospital, she was actually lifeless. Nothing in the natural changed when he said it. The paramedics came, I'm leaving a whole lot out, administered to her. She was still lifeless. They called in to the hospital as they do, saying we've got code blue, whatever it is, on the way. And as she gets there, the doctors and the nurses, the tenants come rushing out on the, with the gurney to go get this dead, lifeless body out of this and try to bring it back to life. When they get out there, they're looking around like, where's the, where's, where's the body? One of the EMT people is like, <laughs> the little girl is walking out of the ambulance. Yes! Walking up to the, and they're like, no, no, no. Well, almost like, you move, little girl. Where's the, where's the one that we've come to resuscitate? The devourer. The life stealer. The killer of you and I who attempts to do that was rebuked because he was a tither. And he knew what to say. And he knew who God was. So the three prophets of God, Bill Winston, Pastor George Pearson. And if y'all don't know who these folks are, go do your homework. And Dr. Mark Barkley, who has released him into the office of the pastor. Would you stand to your feet and welcome this pastor prophet of God? Come on. Pastor Steve Winters, as he ministers to you today. Thank you. Have a seat, please. I'm not putting anybody on the spot, but who in here has not heard of Dr. Mark Barkley? Half? He is an international evangelist, televised. He's on BVOV. He's in the KCM family. He's a dear friend of Kenneth Copeland. He's a prophet of the living God. Every year he puts out what's called an I predict, which has got a multitude, dozens of predictions of what he sees prophetically over the next year. 
marktbarkley.com, B-A-R-C-L-A-Y. I call him dad. He was a Marine. He's got a book out there called God Possessed. That testimony, along with his biography and who he was and what the Lord has done in his life, is available, God Possessed, by Dr. Mark T. Barkley. And it is a powerful, awesome read. He is my spiritual father. I'm honored to call him dad. And one of those suddenly God-possessed moments was the day I came through that line with those three men. Bill Winston. What an awesome presence of God. George Pearsons. What an awesome and powerful wall of love. The grace on that man. And Dr. Mark T. Barkley, Marine, preacher of righteousness. Come on up here a minute. Come here. I'm going through the line. Turn sideways so everybody can see. So I'm going through, and it's Bill Winston, George Pearsons. You're me, okay? You're me. Okay. Dr. Barkley took my hand, and it was about one second, and he stepped back and he said, We need to talk. <laughs> Marine. I'm not military. <laughs> Woo! We need to talk. I need your card. Thank you. You have a seat. That was the introduction. And honestly, I had never heard of him. I had no idea who he was. He was the keynote when I went to that men's conference. But he sure called me out. It went so fast from that point. You get obedient. You get in place, like I was just talking about with the tithe and it will go so fast. You better hold on, because this word accelerate is in God's vocabulary. He accelerated. He propelled me forward faster than I could allow my mind to stretch to the new thing that I needed to occupy. God had a capacity for me that I was not prepared for. Why? Because I had not spent enough time in my prayer closet to be ready for the anointing that hit me when that guy took my hand and said, you are he, calling me out into the five-fold ministry, putting his approval on me, the blessing of the living God, and then sending me out into ministry, which birthed three degrees, which is why I'm here today. We sat at a Starbucks coffee. If you want a fast way for Dr. Barkley to meet with him, tell him you'll meet him at Starbucks. Sitting at a Starbucks, and he started prophesying right there in the restaurant, about 20 minutes. He, by prophetic word, the prophet of God, birthed us. Three degrees. What is three degrees? Haven't heard of that one. No, you probably haven't. We are called, in Dr. Barclay's words, you're going to take what you've been doing in the secular world and bring it into the kingdom of God. Back home, in my little burb of Iron Mountain of 5,000, 6,000, whatever people, I'm an independent CFO. I'm a financial consultant. I'm a business consultant. Overeducated, but joyfully employed. <clears throat> so I'm living in two awesome worlds right now. I've got a great position in business, which has trained me to stand at things like we did this week with this conference and talk about what I know about money and what I know about the Bible, merging the two together and providing natural and supernatural results to make sure that your financial problems go away. For those of you that missed that conference, that what you, that's what you missed. But praise God for technology. Praise God for LifePoint's investment and good equipment. Praise God for the Ministry of Helps. So all those videos will be online, however you may give instruction that they're available. And you can go back and say, Lord, I am sorry for being lazy. I didn't make it. If it was a job, there's a good excuse. But otherwise, watch the videos if you're interested. God is good. And I'm going to preach here for a little bit. It's going to be about position. But when you stand in position before your Lord, where's Amber? Hi, Amber. Oh, you, oh, if the camera was on this side, that was precious right there. That was awesome. I wish we had a camera on that. Oh, no. <laughs> I kind of put Amber on the spot yesterday. When your colonel and drill sergeant said attention, what did that mean? 
Is there a mic in here? <laughs> no. Go ahead. Just go ahead. Tin hut, whatever they would say in the military. And what if you just kind of looked at your drill sergeant and said, I'm not in the mood. <laughs> Doesn't go so good for you, does it? No. That's what we're telling God. That's our message. That anointing hit, thank you, Lord. That anointing hit, and I went into prayer. I, I, uh, my wife is awesome. She sent me with food for as often as possible that the Lord allowed. I went back to my room to get refreshed and refilled for the next session. There was approximately three, 18 hours of teaching between two of us, and everybody stayed awake. I didn't see anybody fall asleep. So we did a, we did a little workshop activity. And this is called a workshop. Have you ever heard of a charismatic workshop? That was my first one. So we did a little workshop. And it was powerful. It was, I, Pastor Randy, he, that was an object lesson. My goodness. That, well, the game, and then there was uh, the, uh, where we had to look at each other and we had to speak. It's called, I wasn't going to go there. I don't want to have to explain what that meant. But um, he, uh, he had us get really close. Zach was my partner. And he had us get really close, really close. And we had to look each other in the eye, about one foot apart. So number one, your personal space has been evaporated. It's gone. Anybody that demands personal space, that would have been a very uncomfortable thing to do. And then to look at that individual, it could not be your spouse or a relative, and to say out loud the vision of your heart of the Lord, your purpose to this individual. And your counterpart is to, the first was to encourage you. You can do it. Hoorah, rah. To get out the pom-poms and say, that sounds great. Wow, that's awesome. I'm excited for you. The second phase of that exercise was now that person gets in your face and says, it ain't going to work. There's no way. You're not qualified. Be quiet. There's no way. Be, who said that? Be quiet. Over here. That, and Jim, you weren't even there, but it's like you were right. Yes. Jim, I'm looking forward to your day. So discouraging. And then the third time, they had to just be silent. But you're supposed to listen as though you were listening for the first time. They've already been reciting this two times through. But on the third time, you're to listen as if it was for the first time that you heard these words intently. Phones are gone. TV is off. Your brain is quiet. Your ears are open. You're expecting. So we did this exercise. I went back to my room. And the Lord spoke. And it's very appropriate for what I'm getting into here. Lord, I am the one on the end that receives the discouraging word. Let that resonate a minute. I am the one on the end that receives the discouraging word. When I try to say my vision to my children, they try to talk me out of it. Can't do that. Haven't done that before. Not now. Not quite yet. Not qualified. That can't be God. But it is. Yes. Know your shepherd's voice and have your confidence only in me. Listen intently like you are hearing for the first time and you will hear much. You have heard before but talked yourself out of it because of you. That's a powerful word. That's a really powerful word. What's the condition of the church? Deaf? Or maybe actually too chatty. We're talking God about his own purposes. That will stop once you understand your position. I need to switch gears here a minute. <clears throat> Don't get nervous by the pages. <laughs> There's a lot here. But if the Lord has me jump around, I want to be ready. 
You'll still make Super Bowl. That's right. All right. Position, passion, prosperity. This is coming. This will manifest. The purpose of the last three days, the Lord is just not letting me go there yet. The last three days, the Lord had a purpose. For those of you that came, even to one session, God bless you. <clears throat> Good morning. Something's ministered to you. Your countenance has changed. Your countenance. Something's lifted. Amen. The lady you're sitting next to right there, cherish her. Make her a priority. Keep listening. Are you feeling this? Are you feeling this? Come on, people. Pray in the Spirit, whatever you're being led to do here, but if you're missing this, repent and ask the Lord to allow you to join in. This church is more than capable and more than ready to usher in the Spirit of God. Something transitioned here. You're expecting. Thank you, Jesus. Ears to hear, Lord. Eyes to see. Sensitive hearts. Hallelujah. Is there a word over here? Bishop, pastor? Is there a word? The Lord would say to this place that there is a there's a dam that has been breached. That that the the congregation of the people have created a dam. They they have walled off the water of God. They wall, they had walled off the blessing, the outpour, the overflow of God. But the dam this morning has been breached. And that dam no longer blocks, hallelujah, the flow of the water of God. And the water of God brings in the outpour, the blessing, the overflow. And I sent my prophet, anointed with overflow, to release it into this which has been a dry valley, no longer is a dry valley in Jesus' name. Thank you, brother. <clears throat> Amen. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of the spirit of fainting, so they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. Why? 
that he may get the glory. And Jesus speaks in Luke 4, 21, Today has this scripture been fulfilled in your presence. Today. <clears throat> Jesus declares, Today the scripture has been fulfilled in your presence. The people that were hearing him at that moment doesn't, did not understand what we understand today. But that was the very moment where Jesus was declaring, no more. 4,000 years, enough. Back off. This is my time. Vengeance. Punishment inflicted or retribution exacted for an injury or wrong. This is the day of vengeance of our God. Let's plug that in. This is the day of punishment inflicted and retribution exacted for the injury and wrong that Satan tried to wreak on humankind until Jesus went to the cross for us. Take your day of vengeance today through your Lord, by faith, by receiving this word of your rightful position and your rightful inheritance and what belongs in your life as we look at the fact that you have been given a garland, a crown, which is authority of a king. You've been anointed with oil, the oil of gladness, the oil of the Holy Spirit, the anointing that raises you up of just simple humanity instead of fitting in with the status quo of just being the guy that takes the same commute every day for the nine to five. Instead, you are taking a commute to your ministry. You're taking your commute to your prosperity. And as you're driving and praying in the spirit, the Lord is showing you things to come because that's what our Jesus does. I do believe I'm with my own people here. I'm having fun. And may I say, that was the most joyful, blessed, fun tithe I have ever in my life witnessed. That was cool. You keep doing that. It made me clap. I want to hear more of that. When I go online and watch, I want to see that. The dancing, the clapping, the rejoicing, and Kirk Franklin. Jesus was sent to preach to the people how things were supposed to be. Jesus was coming to reveal himself as the bread of life, as the one that sets man free, but he was also called in that day to reveal to you the way things ought to be. The rest of the New Testament gives confirmation to Jesus' declaration that today is this day. We are to live how God originally designed us to live. We were never designed to be poor or have a broken heart or be held captive to anything. And may I add to that, to be held captive to anyone. We need to keep our focus on our position and not our condition. We need to have our eyes opened by the Lord. It is supernatural. I promise you, if you don't try to do this supernatural, it will not work. We need to have our eyes opened to our position and no longer on our condition. On God's point of view and not on man's point of view. By God's opinion and not by man's opinion. No matter how the hurt may have come into your life, no matter where you may find yourself today because of yesterday's choices, 
no matter what the bondage might look like. We are no longer going to see our condition that some people have actually fabricated for us and we've received the lie. It's broken now in Jesus' name. But rather, instead of seeing in the natural, instead of seeing what we've got when we pull in the driveway, instead of looking at our vehicle with 250,000 miles on it and I still owe money on it, instead of seeing a paycheck for only $14, instead of anything in this natural that would resemble the curse, we are through with it. And our view is now of the eternal God. His view is from above down to us, but in reality, it's from within us. What he sees is Jesus. What he sees is prosperity. And he sees health. He sees you as perfect and righteous, sitting on a throne with your Lord, your brother, next to him at his right hand, the place of authority, and the place that you are each belonging in today. Today. If I'm too loud for you, it's amazing what comes out of me with one bullet point. Amen. Understanding our position in Jesus Christ is key to growing up and experiencing the fullness of God and his love. When we were born again, we did not become the servants of the Most High God, we became the children of the Most High God. However, the Lord says that most of my church is behaving like servants. And I have a whole section in my message this morning that I just wrote this morning and plugged in here because the Lord said, your message is exactly where I want it to be, but you're missing a component that these people need to hear, so put it in now. So I'm at my computer at 7 o'clock this morning, putting, that's why all these pages are in here. This word, that my children are behaving like servants and not children, I promise you, before my God, is for this church right now. We're done being servants. Are we to serve God? Absolutely. But you become a child first. You receive sonship first. Now go serve. We are the children of the king, sons and daughters of the Most High, and we've received his glorious inheritance now, today. Today. The church needs to see its true identity, our sonship to the Father, and so many of us are stuck in a servant mindset. And so now I'm going to ask you a favor. Not only be expecting, but let's take a scripture that you have read however many times it's been preached on and how many, many church services you've attended. Let's look at it with fresh eyes, with the eyes of the Lord, and let's look at how the Lord lays out relationship, father to son, father to daughter, and what he expects in that relationship from his children it is about relationship, and it is about two sons, not one son. And it deals with a father with two sons and not servants. They are sons, but they didn't get it. They didn't understand what they had already right in front of them. They possessed everything and still worked in the field. We are no longer going to work in the field doing our own thing laboring and toiling to try to make some type of success happen in our life. We are done trying to kickstart our own good. Amen. It is time to do this the Lord's way, but you will only begin to do that if you accept the fact that you are a child of the King and that your rightful place is truly, as we sing, I'm a son, I'm a daughter, I am positioned with the Father and he loves me. Luke 15. I am going to be in Luke 15 for the next several minutes, so go ahead and turn there if you want. Starting at verse 11, And he said, Jesus, the parable of the prodigal son, 
A man had two sons. It's titled prodigal son, but the guy had two. The younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. So he divided his wealth between them. And not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. That's a message by itself. Now, when he had spent, why are many of you in the position that you're in today? Squandering. Love disciplines. I'm not here to coddle you. This body, the way that you're able to usher in the spirit, this body is matured enough to be disciplined. This body is matured enough to receive correction without offense. This body is matured enough to highly esteem the office of these two in the front row and say, yes, sir, no, ma'am, the Spirit of God bears witness to the fact I need to stop or I need to do because I'm out of place. Squandered his estate with loose living. Now, we need to spend everything. A severe famine occurred in that country, and he began to become impoverished. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens in that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the slop of the swine. No one gave him anything to eat. The younger son goes to the father and says, give me your inheritance. Is it not fascinating that the father didn't say, you're too young? He didn't say, I'm not dying yet anytime soon. He didn't scold him. He didn't do it in anger. The Bible just simply says, he did it. Don't you dare ever see yourself as not qualified or not in a position to receive from God. He will not say no. He may say not yet, depending on your ask. If you ask amiss, according to James, he's not going to say no. Not if it is his will, the calling on your life within your vision and purpose, a promise of his word. There's no indication that the request upset the father. He simply divided the son's share. But the son's immature attitude wasted the money and ended up feeding pigs, an illegal animal for a Jew to have. The son came to an end. Mm, There's another message. The son came to an end. In our conference, there were many in that room that came to an end. They stopped existing. I'm alive in Christ, nevertheless. I died. I am alive in Christ, but the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That transition happened in several people. They came to an end. And it is unfortunate that many of us need to come to an end and do a full face plant before we get this stuff. Before the word I'm preaching to you this morning is understood, received, and actually manifesting in our hearts and in our lives, we need to come to an end. By God's grace, I decree over you that you will not reach an end in order to hear these words, but rather that you will find the humility and the conviction of the Holy Spirit that you will rise up out of that pit, not fall on your face, but receive the grace of the truth to set you free and to walk out of this room different than you walked in to the degree that you manifest blessing upon blessing even yet today. Today. The son came to an end and admitted that his father's servants were, you bet. The ends hurt. And it's usually not just you, they hurt. Don't be selfish. The son came to an end and admitted that his father's servants were eating better than him. But when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread? But I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer be worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Servant mentality. 
He chose to go home, humble himself to his father, and request that he becomes a servant. It's the only way he found himself worthy in his father's sight. To work for the kingdom of God. I have to do this. I have to do this. Maybe God loves me now. or maybe not yet. So I'm going to do this. And now I'm going to have the devil lead me to this. And I'm going to involve myself and say yes to this. And then I'm going to do this. And I'm going to get the next thing and the next thing. Well, maybe now daddy loves me. Well, no, no, no. We've got to go over here now. They need a volunteer. I'll be your servant, God. Love me. Please. Beggar. He got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. The father saw him far off. The father saw him far off. Not only saw him far off, he ran. Stop running. Stop running away. Stop, turn around, and see that Father God is looking way off to where you've traveled to, way off to where you've strayed, to where you've rebelled, to where you've said, no, not today, way off to where you've discouraged him to fulfill something in your life. The moment you turn, the moment you give your attention back, he takes care of the rest. He'll make up the difference. Let's go back a little bit into that passage. I will go up and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be your son. Make me as one of your hired men. Verse 20. He got up and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to the father, you guys aren't getting that. You guys aren't getting that. I'll keep rereading this till you get it. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. The son got up and came to the father. And while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. He felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. Unconditional love. Whatever conditions have been forced on you for love, they end now. No one is allowed to condition you to love them. No one. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. While the father was loving him, while the father was kissing him, he is still trying to convince the father that he should be a servant. I'm the one in the position of receiving the discouraging word. My children are trying to talk me out of blessing them. I'm willing to kiss their face, hold them. And they're telling me, I can't right now. I got to go do something. While they smell like a pig, let's throw that one in there too. Your stench doesn't bother him at all. This is a picture of the church. This is a picture of today's church. You get this word today, life point goes on the map in the kingdom of God. Your candlestick gets 10 times brighter. You get more angels to protect you. Do you get that? You get more angels. The angels are sent to protect the anointing. The angels are sent as ministers for you. They are sent to protect the anointing. 
If your anointing only right now requires one angel standing at the door out here, you need some fuel. Come on. Man, rise up and tell God we need a legion. We need a legion at life point. Camp them out on this property. Camp them out at the front door. Camp them out in here. And at every one of your doorsteps. Put them over my fence. We need a legion. We got too much going on here, God. But the father said to his slaves, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and celebrate. He's still trying to kiss his son and at the same time bark our orders to his army of servants while his son is still trying to join the ranks. For the son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to celebrate. The son was starting to get it. The younger son was starting to get it. They, he joined them. He was celebrating too. He might have danced a little bit, but was still feeling a little condemned. He might have eaten a little bit, but his stomach still burned a little bit with indigestion. He may have had conversation with a few folk, but not able to look him in the eye because of shame. But you know what? He celebrated. He received his position and he celebrated despite what the habits of the old thinking was. He shook it off. He joined the party. He joined his father and he said, I belong. The father did not respond to the son's shame. Ignored him. Flat out shut him down. He wasn't looking for another servant. He already had an abundance. You know what? I don't know how many are up there or how many are in this room, but God's got more than just a couple angels. They are the servants. He doesn't need you to be a servant. He's well equipped. So let's go to the other son and see what's going on here. The other half, the one that gets neglected, the one that should feel left out. Now his older son was in the field, and when he came and approached the house, he heard music and dancing. Hmm. And he summoned one of the servants. Oh, my goodness. He summoned one of the servants? He couldn't go to his dad? He had to go to a servant. Father, I have such a need. But you know what? You can help me. It's the same thing as running away from God to get an answer from somebody else when the answer all along is once you take that kiss from the Father. He called over one of the servants and began inquiring what these things could be. And he said to him, your brother has come and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And he became angry and was not willing to go in. He threw a two-year-old tantrum. And his father came out and began pleading with him. You guys are getting this? I'm just going to tell you, you're getting this? So, what I was going to say about that word pleading, you've actually made it not necessary because you're already there. You've already caught on, most of you have already caught on to the plead of the Father and what he intended on doing here this morning. That's, that's an honor. That's a real honor. The Father pleads to be recognized. Plead. Think of that word plead and how strong a vernacular that is. But he answered and said to his father, look, for so many years I have been serving you. For so many years I have been serving you and I have never neglected a command. Even though I created in my own mind most of them. And 
and yet you have never given me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when his son, this son of yours, couldn't even call him by name, when the son of yours came who has devoured your wealth with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. Where was the son? Where was he? He was not in the house. Where was he? He was out in the fields. Who owned the house? The son did. The inheritance had already been split. Where was he? In the field. Who owned the house? Who owned the servants? He didn't, have, he didn't have a single one that knew how to work the field? This is an agricultural community and he didn't have a single servant that knew how to work in the field? What do you escape to? What do you run away to? What's your excuse? Stop running. His true attitude and heart were revealed. After coming out of the field with the sound of the party going on, he got angry and pouted and refused to go in. The older son was not only trying to be a servant, he was thinking like one, talking like one, and acting like one. He had a complete servant mindset. Exhausting, pointless, and without any reward at all. You've never killed a fattened calf for me. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't even get a goat. Even though everything the father owned belonged to him, both sons were trying to be servants, but both sons, were, with both sons had position and inheritance, but neither one accepted their rightful place. The one reached an end. The one came to an end and started hearing truth to be set free. The other one rejected it till the end. He stayed angry and couldn't even call his brother by name and would rather talk to a servant than his dad. The church has been too busy trying to serve God, thinking and acting and talking like servants, not sons. They're already, uh, there's already a multitude of angels serving God continuously, and he does not need another servant. So I say it again. We are indeed to serve God. You are better positioned now than when you walk through the door this morning to do exactly that. A little truth and some small adjustments go a long way in the kingdom of God. A little truth, one hour, and some small adjustments by the Holy Spirit make great strides in the kingdom of God. Give a little and watch God do a lot. God wants to bring many sons to glory, but we are all too busy working out in the field, doing our own thing. Galatians 4, 4 to 7. When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir, through God, the Spirit himself testifying with our spirit that we are the children of God, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ. Not co-heirs, joint heirs. Fellow heirs, not co-heirs, joint heirs. If I'm a co-heir, and you're my brother, how much do we get? Joint heirs. The brothers here in the prodigal son were joint heirs. And everything gets given away, but it's split. Excuse me, I said that wrong. The co heirs. Co heirs split. Joint heirs, all is the same. I'm sorry I flipped that, went backwards on it. The joint heirs get the same inheritance to share in the entire estate. So Jesus says, everything the Father has been given unto me. Everything the Father has has been given unto you. Yes. Joint heirs. Doesn't it make sense? I'm a dad of six. Beautiful family back home waiting for me. 
My wife and I pray almost every day for, or we do pray every day, whoever said amen. But almost every time we come together in prayer, we ask the Lord for parental wisdom, parental love, and parental counsel with parental discipline to raise our kids. That we would parent them the way that the Father himself parents them. We work very hard that our children follow our example. I want my son to grow up to be like me. Doesn't it make a whole lot of sense that our Father in Heaven wants a whole lot of kids that look like Jesus? As he is, so are we in this world. 1 John 4, 17. God views and sees a completed you. Nothing broken, nothing missing, nothing neglected. A completed you, finished and redeemed in the work of the cross, in the perfect position of righteousness. 